right. Thanks. Um, so just a bit of a disclaimer before we get started. I spent the entire day at a sales conference. So if I start doing this, you know, just, just <laughs> bear with me, okay? <laughs> Doctors say it'll go away on its own. All right. So I'm Tejas Preek. Uh, I'm from Rivalry. And I was asked to present a talk about our retrospective in terms of using Rails and AngularJS together. So some of the, you know, so just to you know, give a bit of an introduction as to what it is that we do, right? Rivalry is built with AngularJS and Rails, and we provide, and this is not the elevator pitch, this is just what, what we do. The ele you know, we provide analytics, metrics, and most importantly, we allow sales managers to coach their sales reps. And the reason that people are going to use our software as opposed to hacking it all together with emails and spreadsheets and reports from Salesforce is that we're supposed to be easier. We're supposed to make their lives easier. So interaction is really important to what we do. And that's a key focus for how we, how we build technology. Uh, a little bit about me at the very beginning is a um, you know, CTO and co-founder. I have my picture up there just in case I forget because I get nervous on stage. <laughs> and you know, I have about 10 years of experience doing UI, UX. So I've, been doing this for a little bit. Um, and I've done a lot of uh, things, not, not full time, but within other projects for rich internet applications. I, I developed um, a Flex application for We the Citizens. This was way back in like when Flex I think, 3 came out. Uh, I was a web framework developer at Accelerator. So Accelerator, before they went out to the Valley to become a mobile software company, they were a web framework company. And I did Flex and another project called Vaden at Vertical Acuity. So we've been, I've been doing internet application stuff for a while. And that's, I think, uh, maybe important to either see whether I'm jaded or just have some experience in this matter. All right, so the structure of this talk is, uh, I'll you know, debate this a little bit, but I think I'm gonna give an overview of AngularJS. How many of you use Angular on a regular basis? Okay, a good amount. How many of you know what Angular is? Okay, and all right, so I will, uh, you know, so I'll try to keep that relatively high level and brief and not dig too far into the details on that. And then talk about Angular, the good, bad, the ugly. And our, we'll also talk about our future with it. It's actually a, a time, very timely thing because of the recently announced skiism between Angular 1.0 and Angular 2.0. All right, so Rivals architecture, and this is like a really simplified diagram of it all, is we have AngularJS, and that's on the front end, and it does all of our presentation logic. It does all our page transition, it handles all of our click events, it handles all the template rendering, and we have it hooked up with our Google Analytics. Anytime anyone does anything in there, it'll send that information back out to Google. And then Rails is really there for our business logic, it accesses the data sources, and then it communicates everything to the front end via JSON calls. So there isn't a whole lot, of, we don't do any templating, we don't really do any page transitions inside of, inside of a Rails app. So Rails is pretty simple for this perspective. All right, so you know, start off with the easy question, why Rails? We knew how it worked. You know, there's good libraries connecting to salesforce.com, and it's really easy. I mean, I think if you've, if you've used it and you're here as a Ruby group, you probably have, have a similar opinion of that, if you don't think it's bloated. Uh, why AngularJS? Front-end interaction was a selling point. So the reason everyone keeps trying to go back to rich web internet applications is that they seem really easy, they seem really intuitive, they, they feel a lot more like a thick app, so if you're trying to build something around the concept that you're trying to make life easier for people, you, you tend to gravitate towards, towards single page apps and frameworks like AngularJS because you think it's gonna be a way to really deliver the kind of experience that you wanna to, want to deliver. And also it has a really good community. It's got backing by Google, so you can't really get much bigger than that. And, but you know, on, the honest answer is that at the end of the day, it was a new toy, right? If you're starting a startup, you have a clean slate, you're gonna to wanna to at least pick one technology that you're not an expert in, so you, even if it fails, you learn something. All right, and so this is gonna be the piece about how we use AngularJS and Rails. It's a really high level view. I'm gonna skip a lot of the basics, sort of assume that the basic level of JavaScript knowledge. Um, and you know, don't fret, there are easier ways to get started, so I think the next slide is, you know, one does not simply create an app with AngularJS. Like you go to the website, there's like this really great like little like one page thing, you can do that. And then you like start to read the forms and no one's writing Angular that way. So there's a little bit of complexity into to building these apps. So I'll try to keep it as simple as possible, and as topical as possible. All right. So like the first thing you gotta do if you're trying to create an Angular app is you have to set this ng app attribute on top of one of your elements. And your, that would be the element that's gonna be containing the entirety of your application. In this case, I've named my application rivalry. 
And then as soon as you do that, you got to create the corresponding JavaScript. Um, I'll put these slides up a little bit later online, so if you can't read it too well, you, should, you can see the code. But this is, you know, all stuff's covered in the tutorials. But, you know, the, the basic thing here is that, you know, you're creating an Angular module, you're adding some configuration. Um, a good, this has a laser pointer, right? Yeah, there we go. So a, a, good, a good thing to note, as always hits me every time I create a new Rails app, is figuring out the correct way to set the cross-site issue you know, tokens. So that's how you can handle it with Angular. And then you create a view container. So that's you know, the ng view piece over here, which goes inside your app. And so the ng view, um, if they, they, you can go on Google, you'll find all sorts of different answers to this. But for, for standard Angular apps, ng view is where your actual like, page will be rendered. It's where, where the stuff will happen. And then if you're using ng-view, you have to create routes. So Angular does do a lot for deep linking. Right? So it, ha it uses this sort of the hash and then I think exclamation point. <coughs> Can't remember exactly how it does it. But so everything after a hash isn't parsed by a server, it's just parsed by the browser. So it uses that area to handle your deep linking within the application. So look at that piece and then make the appropriate route. You had a question? Is there any like somewhat automatic uh, routing, I guess, we're used to resources and Ruby, right? So uh, there might be, not with the default router. Okay. And the structure of the router is just JSON. So pretty much everything is, you set this controller, you set the template URL. A template URL is going to be some HTML that you have cached. Um, you set the active tab. I think that's something specific to us. And we reload the search. So if you change the search parameters, whether or not the page will reload. And then you finally create the actual HTML view. It is you know, high there, and then it uses the double angle, uh, the double curly syntax for templating. And that's actually a critical point. Um, I'll come back to that later. And then, so now you've got your view, you've got your route, you've got your, your, your application, and now you need to create the controller that you're going to add to your, your application. Uh, and I use this, so the, the Angular online, they'll have a little different structure to their code. I really hate. Um, in like just one line parameters. So I tend to break things up and have variables. But what I'm doing here is I'm just creating a, a function that takes in a scope. It takes in a user. A user is, is going to be mine. I'll get that in a second. And it just does some control logic. So in this case, what this, this piece of code is doing is it's getting the user from my Rails instance. All right, there's a few more steps. Are we there yet? No, it's a climb. We'll get there. Create the user in Angular factory. So this is the actual piece, and this is the actual piece that will communicate to my backend for the for the user object. So the nice part of Angular is that it lets me use objects, and in this case, it's a factory, and the resource is a built-in Angular built-in that you know, has a bunch of helper functions in there for automatically getting to to your resources on, on the server side. So it's not really um, automatical routing for the front end bits of it, but it does give you autom you know helper functions for communicating with resources you do have inside of your Rails app. Can everyone hear me okay? I don't know about that corner back there. Finally, you create the user, you know, now, and now you're done, right? So you, 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 this is on the Rails side, so it's really easy because you can just do, you know, generates. That's done, but we still have a little bit more to do. So if you're using Devise, you can you know, load an authorized resource, and then all your Rails code is, and we've done a lot of Angular so far, and this is, the, this is all the Rails you get to write, respond with user. Now we're all done. Because of the way I set up my controller, because of the way I set up my route, because of the uh, way I've set up my routes in, in, in Rails, uh, when someone loads that page with that little piece of curly syntax on there, it'll change the template to, from user.name to Tejas Parikh, assuming that that's what the username was. Any questions about the Angular stuff? I know I went pretty quickly on it. Uh, which version of Angular? Uh, which version of Angular are you using at Rivalry? Uh, we're using 1.2. We haven't upgraded to 1.3 yet. Anything else? All right. 
So that's Angular. That's sort of how we use it. Obviously, there's a lot more actual sophistication that goes on in what we do. But this is just to give you an insight as to sort of the structure behind Angular, some of the concepts, and to explain really these other, other components of it. So what, what do we learn <coughs> through all of this? I mean, there's, there's some good, there's a little bit of bad, and there's, just, there's some pretty ugly. I, I think I was watching the national championship game when I was doing this, so those, that Verizon ad kept coming in my head, and that's the theme song from there. <laughs> all right, so AngularJS, the good. So here's some features we find really awesome. The first one is independent representation. Right, and then this is probably my favorite bit about Angular, is that you know, at least in the jQuery world that I have come from, uh, your, your, your control logic is heavily tied to aspects of your DOM. So you have to have the right stuff on the class, you have to use the right classes, you have to have the right IDs, and like all of that has to, you know, you, you basically are, you know, I spent like a good chunk of time just trying to figure out what, you know, either to add things to my HTML to make the selectors easier, or trying to come up with fancy selectors to get to the elements that I want, that I wanted to control. So because of the way Angular is structured, your control logic is completely independent from your markup. You, know, you could use a, you know, a and in this case, I, I've used the same controller to handle diff completely different representations on the front end. Because what's happening in the controller is it's basically bringing variables, in, you're bringing objects into the scope, setting it in the scope, which then makes it available to the front end. So it's a lot like, it's a lot closer to a, a Ruby route or, or an ERB template and that you can have different templates, but as long as the underlying objects are the same, you, you still get your reuse of, those, of that controller function. There are directives, and directives are why well, I, I you know, feel like they're jQuery plugins on steroids. Right? One of the things with jQuery plugins, if you go to the download folder, you've got some JS, you have some HTML you gotta go stick in a place. You know, there's, there's more than one component to it. A directive nicely wraps all that up. It wraps up the presentation, it wraps up the, you know, the initialization, it wraps up the actual control, the functionality behind it. You know, give one example, like we have this pretty um, in-depth box in our app, and we actually use this box like in a lot of different places, because these are the metrics that we're providing to our end users. And so there's, there's a button bar at the top, you flip between them, as you flip between them, the numbers update, you know, it has the, you know, the various rankings of the person, and this person really needs to up their sales game because they're way behind on their quota. And you know, it, so that, that box encompasses like all of this code. Like the right hand pane here is HTML, the left hand pane is, is the JS, it's not even all of it, there's, there's even more. And so you know, for doing a jQuery plugin, you have to set the element, you have to set the ID, you have to you initialize it the right way. For Angular, all I have to, where did it go? For Angular, all I have to do is add just this one, one piece of code. So that makes it really easy to just bring that, little, that pretty sophisticated box anywhere within my application. Uh, you know, and to, along with that, you have control. Uh, so go back to the controllers, right? It means it makes it really easy to encapsulate and reuse code. And one area that I use this a lot was it, is within iteration. So instead of having it be a case of one piece of like large code and the knowing you're doing loop lookups within the iteration. Basically set a new controller for every, set a new controller on the loop and that'll give me access to specific, that'll within the scope of the loop give me access to methods to do any kind of business or control <coughs> logic. So if I want to hide show elements, it's easy to set it up in here as opposed to having it all cluttered within one spot. And then I can use that, reuse that controller any time I have a, a user loop. So even if I have a user loop on like an admin page and a user loop on a listing page and the, some of the front end inter, inter, action bits are different, if the, if what the hide and show bits are the same, I can use that same controller. <laughs> oh, hey, I'm going to go shut that off. <laughs> you always forget to do one thing when you go into a presentation. <laughs> oh, wait, and... So server communication, again, that's another really good part about it. You know, it makes it really easy to have what really object-based server communication. So instead of, it do, instead of doing you know, the do, dollar dot post, dollar dot get, and then you know, serializing an object, you basically get to treat your objects like objects. And by with using the resource factory, I do scope.user, 
you know, it, it'll pull in the user object eventually. And it, when I have that user object, because of the structure of Angular, I can actually use it like an object. And it's, and it's reactive. Sometimes it's really good. And it's especially nice for manipulating lists. So if you have a, a list on, the, on your client side, you add an element to it, it'll automatically add you know, that, that thing onto your front end. Deep linking already covered that. Uh, but because it supports, like we have a lot of different touch points we get people back into our application. One of them is through emails. And so we need to have a deep link so that when they click that link in the email, they go to the right part of the app to take the action they're trying to do. So that's the good. That's what we liked. And it's quite a bit. And really, that's like the majority of what we do with Angular. But there's some bad. And one of them is, you know, when you're, t when you're doing anything with rich internet applications, you have to think about what basics of browser interaction do you have to recreate, right? And so in this case, in the screen, like, is it loading or is there no data? There's no way to tell unless you, as a developer, provide that context into the screen. So if you're going to do something, you have to put the loading indicator somewhere, or you have to put no data. But if the state when I started working on this screen, and got here and, and you know, it was like, uh, it's just broken? No, 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 it's fine. There's just nobody there. So that's something to be really, really cognizant of. All right. Reactive sometimes, it's great. You know, so when that user object comes in from the, from the back end, it'll automatically update all, everywhere you're using the user object inside of the front end. But when your server is slow or there's something wrong with the renderer, you get some pretty broken looking pages. Right, and this is one. This is just a very simplified example, but you know that username is not there. It shows, you know, nothing. Hope no one's bored yet. And this is probably like one of the biggest fundamental flaws is JS minimization just causes hair loss. I, if you forget, so you know, I don't know if you remembered the slide. Go back to that. Right, so here, you know, what's happening here is that I am, you know, I'm creating a, a definition object, and there's this, this, this resource, this, this array here, and this is the first parameter of the array is the is the matches to the first parameter of the function. Now, if I forget this bit, in development, the code will work, but in production, after it goes to the asset pipeline, after it minimizes my JavaScript, it'll barf, and it'll barf in some really bizarre way. It'll say this this very commonly used thing, resource, which is used in like 60 files, is not found. And all I can do to debug that, unless you really dig into it, is look at this very you know, 20,000 long character long line of JavaScript to figure out exactly which one of those resource calls doesn't have a corresponding array associated with it. And it's not resource when you do that, right? This is going to be like ZX. So that, you know, th that is one of the big downsides of it. And then the other one is this factory, <laughs> this directive, this controllers are all really great. They're all really powerful. They're all subtly different in very small ways. And it causes all sorts of confusion as to what, when you need to use one, when you can't use one, or when you're supposed to use one, especially with directives where there's a link function and a controller function. They look similar. They're treated different. And the documentation doesn't really make it clear, at least not to me, as to why I use one as opposed to the other and what the correct way to do things is. But these are things that I think are livable. You can sort of learn these quirks. You can learn your way around it. Unfortunately, there is, there is some ugly. And uh, for the Angular fans, it's probably the point where you want to ready your flamethrowers at me. All right. If this happens, and my personal feeling is like this should never happen on a front end framework. And this isn't because of some well, it is because of some broken programming, but this is not something that happens all the time. I think the first time that John here saw that, he thought it was having an aneurysm. Like, like you know, what's suddenly happened? This screen was working like three seconds ago, now it's completely broken. Right? But, so, you know, but this kind of thing is, is prone to happen inside of Angular because you, know, you, have, you have a lot of complex things that you're building with the DOM. 
right? And, and, and JavaScript is single-threaded, but there's interrupts, there's things that will cause it to go back out to the server to go fetch new things. So in the case of this, this situation, you know, we could recreate this maybe like one out of every 20 times. And the root cause was that we had an iterator that was within the controller, and the controller included, the HTML included a directive, which is, again, that's going to be like another call out to something and go pull in more, more information. So most of the time, everything loads in the order that we expected, that I expected it to when I wrote the, the thing in the first place. But every now and then, the controller, which is trying to access a, a value on the scope, tries to do it before the directive fully loads, and that value is not there. The resulting undefined kills the loop, and the end user sees this. All of this, of course, can be fixed with a simple dollar timeout zero, which why that would work um, is beyond the scope of this, this talk, but <coughs> it just makes me feel uncomfortable. But that's the reality of dealing with, with rich end applications, because there is not enough instrumentation about how, when specific things load to be able to fully guarantee that this complex interaction, that it's really easy to set yourself up for, because in this case, it was like, there's a loop, there's, a, there's just there's like a little bit of code in here, but because that little bit of code was call, calling more complex code, things would break every now and then. So it's really easy to get yourself tr stuck in that trap, and you end up with users who will call in and say, hey, this stuff is broken, and then your support reps are like, you're, you're, this user is crazy, because I can't make this happen. And then the biggest problem with AngularJS, as of, I think, a month ago, is that AngularJS 1.0 is deprecated. And I don't know, there's been, there's been a lot of like internet angst about that. And I think it's, it's for me, it's a jelly, it seems like a good thing, because Angular 2.0 is, is a massive improvement. Um, it's a but it's a completely new API. So you're going to have to rewrite all of your Angular 1.0. And there's lots of really good reasons why they did that. Um, there's a great blog post. It's super long, super informative, super in-depth about the real differences between the two, two products. And uh, to go in a nutshell, uh, this slide's a little bit later, but to go in a nutshell, like the, the problem isn't so much AngularJS. The problem is just rich internet applications in general. Like there's just challenges with trying to build something really complex with really good interactions on top of a browser that doesn't give you access to that information. And so what the AngularJS 2.0 team is doing is that they're looking at ECMA 6, uh, 6, which has a lot more functionality and has a lot more ability to really do things like annotations, custom elements, the shadow DOM, to prevent a lot of the slowness and a lot of the problems that come with trying to do rich end applications with today's technologies. So retrospective, and so would we use AngularJS again? You know, if, we were to start, if we had to start a new project today that was completely unrelated to what we're building right now, or had to launch a new app, would this be a direction we went? And the answer, oh, whoops. The answer is pretty unequivocally no, right? It's, we know, we know AngularJS is so broken that the AngularJS one point, AngularJS team says that we're not going to support it very long. You know, it's going to be 13 months after Angular 2.0 comes out, or something like that, um, before they say we're, it's no longer in support. Angular 2.0 is a completely different direction to take the, the code. So uh, to me, that's a bit of a tacit assumption that what we did before is, is broken. It doesn't work. It, it, AngularJS was, was there to make it life easier for designers. Developers started using it, and it, you know, it's evolved, but it hasn't really been designed. So knowing the 2.0 is coming out soon is going to be much better, I wouldn't make any bets on using more 1.0. Um, again, as this is alluding to this earlier, but it's not really AngularJS's fault, right? There's just challenges that haven't been fully addressed by current browser technologies. And thankfully, IE is being developed again, which <laughs> means that there's hope that you know, the next version of ECMAScript will actually be adopted across the board, and we'll have some really good tools, but we're still at least a year away from that. So if we're going to do something new, you know, what are our key considerations? Like, you know, we, I think we would consider whether single page apps are right for us. Uh, there was a good blog post by Twitter, it actually came out a couple years ago, but I think a lot of the points are still relevant, where they really focused on what the user is hitting that, app, that web page for. And in Twitter's case, they're hitting the web page to see the first couple tweets, and then they might stay there to go find more tweets. So they really worked really hard optimizing the initial page load 
and then, then bringing in the interaction afterwards. I think for one of our major use cases, which is people with sales reps logging in to fill out a brief, that might be the approach we take in the future, is really make it really quick for them to get into the application, do what they need to do, and if they're going to be there longer, then make sure that we're using the, the correct uh, like Require.js or other tools like that to bring in the appropriate elements at the appropriate time so we're not forcing the, browser, the, the users to go download a gob of JavaScript, a bunch of CSS, a bunch of HTML, a, like the, the giant blob of HTML templates just to do a 30 second task. Now we pick a framework for developers. Uh, AngularJS is great, it can let you build things really quickly. You can get so far with Angular so quickly only to hit roadblocks when you're trying to make it make, you know, make an app that's really production ready and very large. And we'd also focus on framework stability. Look at where the community is, look at whether the community is uh, bought into Angular. One of the things that concerns me about any benefactor backed uh, project is as soon as that, that project stops being important to the benefactor, will it continue to, to be maintained? Um, Ember is more interesting because it's more community backed, but I don't know what the right answer here is. We haven't done the evaluation yet. And so our next steps, I mean, as much as I dislike where we are with Angular, it's not worth it for us to, to change it out. So I think because of what we see on the horizon in terms of new front-end development tools, it makes sense just to continue on with AngularJS that for the applications where we have it, wait and see how ECMAScript, script is, sorry, ES6 is adopted, see what frameworks are coming around that really support that, and then if we have to piece and replace any parts that are non-performant in our current setup. All right, so any questions, and, or you can tell me why I should love Angular. As someone who's done both uh, Rails and uh, a fair amount of Angular development, I'm a little disappointed to hear you reach the conclusion that you didn't like it or it wasn't the right decision for you guys. Um, you know, maybe it was just the right decision for you guys. But uh, in, in truth, I don't think I've heard any front-end JavaScript developer, especially one who comes from a Rails background, tell me that they've found you know, the magic JavaScript framework. And I've done a lot of them over the years. I've done Spine, Backbone, Angular. I've tried writing my own. I've done plain old jQuery. Like, you name it, I've probably looked at it. Uh, but what's, what's interesting to me about that problem, and, and I think it's more, it's not a, you're right, it's not an Angular problem. I think there's a bigger problem in the front end development as a whole. And everybody likes to complain about JavaScript a little bit. Um, but what I keep finding is that people don't know what they want out of a JavaScript framework. And uh, you don't have these good framework tools like Rails. I don't think anybody in this room would stand up and say Rails is a t terrible tool to build a back end with. I probably wouldn't be here if that was the case. So, how do we get past that as a community that we're, we're complaining and complaining and complaining about all these front-end toolkits? Yeah, so I think it, it's more an aspect of back-end coding and front-end coding are different beasts. You're sort of serving, you have different needs on the back end than you do on the front-end. I think one of the big areas where I've seen the, the front-end bit really fall apart is misunderstanding the needs of your application from a product perspective and not realizing, like, you're not really properly picking the right tool for the job. So in the case, of, in our case, right, I think it's we, pick, we picked the wrong tool for the job. There's probably situations where AngularJS is, is perfect because what it provides is something that, you know, if you're, if you're trying to build, uh, not, not to hate on like internal apps, right, but if you're trying to build like an internal app to let your um, finance guy access some reports real quickly, like Angular is perfect for that. It really is set up well to, to deliver that. But if you're trying to build a relatively complex front end to deliver to end users and customers, maybe you need to pick something lighter. So I, I think, you know, because Rails kind of, you know, Rails is like this just shell and then you can plug in like all sorts of gems, you can plug in all sorts of other libraries, you can use different databases, different data stores, like it's sort of like the, the sort, of, sort of more of a control flow piece of it, so to speak, right? You, you, don't, you don't feel as much of that pain on the back end, but when you're on the front end, because you don't control anything besides, you know, be, maybe minimum browser versions, you're sort of stuck with, with trying to like, you know, like I, I know I need, uh, I know I need, I know this specialized tool will really help me in one case, but 
I, I don't know if, if the whole, like, there might be a square peg here and there might be a round, a round plug, but you know, you're just trying to make them work. You mentioned several times that some of your problems extended from sort of the way that Rails and Angular work together, the asset pipeline uh, and, you know, the, the CSRF tokens. I've run into all those problems myself. One thing we're looking at at Springbot, because we also use Angular on the front end, Rails on the back end, uh, one thing we're looking at is kind of breaking those concerns apart. So have your Rails app, have it be an API, and develop that like a Rails developer would build a Rails app. But then we're actually looking at taking all of our front end code and completely detaching that from our Rails app and host it in you know, a standalone uh, node app. Or, I mean, there are plenty of tools with Grunt, Yeoman, some of these other front end tools. There, there's a lot of workflow that makes some of that a lot easier. And that's one thing I've uh, kind of extracted from the Angular documentation is that they don't, like the developer or the people that are maintaining Angular don't write it with the intention of integrating it with Rails. You can, of course, but that's not what they're writing it specifically to do. So to a large degree, you can solve some of those pain points you're having by breaking it out and let the front end tools do what front end tools do best. Um, and then at the end of the day, there's no reason you couldn't host the entire front end as a entirely static application on S3 that talks to your Rails app as a purely API service. And you know, I, I hope that's the right approach for us to go. We're going to give it a shot, and I'd love to you know tell you, tell you how it went yeah. in that's six it. months when we find out if it was right or wrong. Right. But yeah. I mean, the only thing that I <coughs> the only thing that I'm not a huge fan of with the another thing I'm not a huge fan of with the single page apps is uh, that especially the way Angular is written right now with the curly brackets, like you have to parse the entire DOM to do anything. And I can't control how fast their, their browser can render stuff. Right? I, can, I can control how fast my servers render stuff. So that's like the only place where I'm really feeling like less like going that route and going more towards a traditional Rails route with, and using a front-end framework to handle the interactions. Is there a question? <coughs> Uh, yeah, I guess a quick response to you. Um, I personally am an Ember developer, but um, I guess like uh, a year-ish ago, we broke out our front-end repo into like its own application and do exactly what you said. It's just a static app that's on S3. Um, well, the Rails app serves like the index app, but you know, your JS and what have you is on S3. Um, haven't looked back, it's so great. That's That sounds like the correct decision. And um, I feel like, so I guess some of your like main gripes with Angular so you had the like WTF example. I feel like something like that is like a really good example of like something Ember would be very good at. Like promises kind of circumvent that problem, right? Like you don't show the stuff until you have your data. You know, it seems like there was was the issue that it was like a race condition where you were rendering before the data was available. No, the issue was that I was rendering before. So the all right. Uh, so there was a there was a loop. There's a directive. The directive was calling a JavaScript charting library. And then the directive, after it initialized the library, is putting that value on the stack. Because I didn't know exact, because the directive doesn't know exactly when that library is fully loaded, it's putting a value onto, into the scope before it's defined. And that was, so it wasn't like a loading from the server. Okay, so it was yeah. more just front end loading was happening out of order. OK. Well, yeah, third parties from your front end library is like <laughs> yeah. hell. So yeah, I hear you. Uh, but ember.run helps out with that too. Uh, anyways, I'm just going to quick plug. And also, Ember CLI is really good for tooling. The asset pipeline is super fast, but like, I don't know. Again, we moved away from that like a year ago, and it's been magical. So, okay, that's all I had to say. You got one up here? You gave a user as your example uh, showing you know, my name come up. Um, with your single page app, how are you handling authentication? Are you using that client side, server side, uh, tokens, et cetera? Yeah, the, um, the RHTML is loading. So basically, it's authenticated. It's the, inside the authenticated page is the actual app. And then the, so we have some level of Rails views, which are just doing the, the front end. They're just doing the authentication <laughs> bit and handing it off to the inside the authenticated framework. So <clears throat> on most of your gripes, uh, the thought I was having was, isn't this why you use open source software? Because you ha have a community that's also going to have the same gripes. You know, there's a couple of them that you mentioned that I, I know there are modules out there that people have developed. 
that you can plug into your Angular apps. I mean, isn't with any open source software project you have, you're going to have these type of gripes? Well, you're going to have, I mean, there's no perfect software out there. So you're right. I think for me, the, the majority of the, the real gripe is the fact that you know, the, the way that the framework is written right now is not the way the framework is going to be in the future. So there, there's a fundamental problem there. To me, to me that says, I don't think anyone's really come out and said there's a fundamental problem. But really, if you read between the lines, there's a fundamental problem there. And so, yes, you're right. We can, you know, open source is great. So if you are on Angular 1.0, you've got an app you want to run for the next five years, there's going to be support for that. But on the other hand, you're not, you know, there, there's just something enough wrong. But if you're going to do it for a new project, you probably wouldn't want to go that route. Because the, the smartest people in the world, the people working at Google, are like, no, this isn't the way to go. So I'm, I'm curious, not knowing much about the Angular community, uh, with your comment that uh, yeah, 2.0 is awesome, fantastic. It's going to break everything. Uh, having some friends in the Python community and seeing how quickly everyone was just jumping onto Python 3 with that. Uh, that was sarcasm. Uh, I am curious what the general community response is to 2.0. Are people like just, is the community actually rallying behind moving to this newer, completely different pinnacle? Or is everyone kind of just like stepping away from it and saying, no, not me, thanks? Yeah, there, there's a lot of hysteria. Uh, a lot of people are really upset about it. Uh, I think the community is going to rally behind 2.0 because it, I think 2.0, if they do it right, they time it right, has the opportunity to be one of the first fully ECMAScript 6 compatible frameworks. And that's really like the core problem is that you don't have the, the richer abilities that you do with the Shadow DOM. You don't have the richer abilities you do with custom elements. So that's, I think, the focus of, of Angular 2.0. They're seeing, I mean, they work at Google, they build a browser, so they're seeing where browsers are going, and they're going to try to build something for that. Yeah, so this is kind of a generic question just for front end frameworks, but so, so you work at a startup, and you're, um, like, do you have any advice on when to make that decision to go with an entire, like, front end framework? Because I've done both things. I've done the, like, you know, you head first into uh, Backbone or something, and you just use it everywhere. I've also done the like jQuery spaghetti code until it's terrible everywhere scenario. Is there like, is there any criteria when you're like getting started where you're like, okay, we're definitely going to need an entire front end solution, or do you kind of like, is there always like a breaking point where you end up switching an app? I, maybe you didn't hit that point with Ravelry, but I was just curious. Yeah, I've hit that point with other projects in the past, uh, and it, I've never had to rewrite completely rewrite an entire jQuery app into something else. I have, on multiple occasions, have to, had to rewrite a rich internet application into jQuery and, and pages. So I, I'm probably a little biased in that regard. I feel like if you have a, a jQuery app with different RHTML templates, it's a lot easier to combine the, the common piece of <coughs> functionality into a single page app than it is to take it apart, because you can do it piecemeal. Like you can still have a page, you know, like your admin page rendered with something else, right? and then have your, your core app be in, in a rich framework. Whereas if you do everything in the rich framework, it's, I think it's a little harder to break it off into different pieces. I don't know if you've had any experience with Google Web Toolkit, which uh, you know, also is a Google project. Um, one of the things that framework I thought really got right was their ability to split code. And you could define sort of, if I'm on the user module page where I'm managing users, I don't need all the code associated with listing orders. And so they had a mechanism for loading in the code that you needed at the right time, um, which is really interesting. I think maybe you know you, you mentioned you were talking about single page applications, decomposing them into standard you know round trip Rails applications. You know, may, probably single page applications are not exactly the right approach. Um, one thing I've found some success with is sort of based on your application, find those logical points, right? Make your user management page a single page application, but it lives alongside an order management page. You know, and they can function as independent pages, so that way everything you're doing with orders loads really fast. You know, everything you're doing with users loads really fast. But if you have to hit a, you know, a hard refresh between those different modules, that makes a lot of sense that you know, the user is probably tolerant of that change, and then you're not loading tons and tons and tons of code that you're not going to use on a particular page. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and definitely, you know, I think some of the, the friend alluded to earlier was this, a, lot, a lot of this, this sort of angst about front-end frameworks comes from not understanding the user flow and the product flow properly. 
And if you do have like a really good idea of how your users are going to go through your application, then you can use the more heavy interaction frameworks for the pieces where they're going to be in a tight loop with, of interaction with your application. So going through an order, or in our case, um, you know, looking through a bunch of different metrics, right? And then if you ha but if you know that you know, that they're going to spend like 30 minutes doing this and then two minutes doing this. You, so you know that they're going to spend a lot of time here, a lot of time here. Then you can break in the middle because they're not going to be as concerned. They know, they know they're going to a different part of the application. The other thing that's really uh, enlightened me on over the uh, last couple of years working with very front-end heavy applications is that it requires a different kind of engineer to build them. You know, it's no longer just a jQuery sort of designer, oh, it's just HTML and CSS, you know, JavaScript, whatever. You know, it says right there in the name, single page application. It kind of infers that you need an application engineer. And one thing that's really helped uh, my mindset is to think about my JavaScript front end much in the same light that I would think about an iPhone app. Now, I wouldn't hire a designer to write my iPhone app any more than I would hire a designer to write my JavaScript front end in the, you know, all these front end heavy applications. Yes, and to also to add to that point, you know, it, because you're encapsulating so much of the UX inside of your application, you need to have a UX aware. It doesn't have to be like a, the best UX person, but the UX aware developer doing the front end because they're going to have to make that real time decision about you know what what pieces like you know, the, the, the interaction is broken, so I need to add a loading indicator, or I need to hide this element. Any other questions? Hi, Tejas. Hey, Lauren. How are you? Good. Good. So I want to ask the room. I mean, is anyone in here who's like a, who's productive with Rails? Like you can bang out CRUD and and then make it pretty. And then you add Angular or Ember or whatever. That the whole time you're writing the JavaScript, the front end stuff, you're not like, God, it could be so much faster if I was just doing straight up Rails. I mean. I, I'm waiting for like that epiphany of like, okay, we're we're doing this now. We're finally like, I finally feel like it's fluid. I find, I mean, I, I know I'm saying the same thing everyone's already said, but is, do, am I alone in that, or is the whole time you're like, if only, if you know, I I don't want to write this curly brace as the template right now. I want it to just be ERB or Slam or whatever your favorite tool is. Like, I just constantly am like doubting. Like, God, I could probably just throw all this away, rewrite it all in Rails right now, and flush the last three weeks of work and be done tomorrow. Or maybe it's three months from now because I'm not going to do that because I think one day I'm going to get a payback from this or, or the, you know, or this UX is going to fucking pay off and I'm going to get rich finally. But like, is, is that doubt not just? Is, am I alone in that or is that everyone who's doing this like when is this going to happen? We have some hands raised. He said autocomplete. Yeah, I mean another thing to keep in mind too is. Today's age, it's not just web browser from a like an application standpoint. You've got mobile, so that's you know eventually, assuming your business grows, rivalry might have a mobile app or tablet-based app. So if Tejas doesn't want to rewrite the entire back end to render that out, he's now decoupled his front end presentation on the web standpoint from his API. So, I mean, if you do that split there, I mean, you're at least going to get that payoff when you start building your mobile front end. Yeah, but I think Rails makes it pretty easy to. It saves you from, from building too much of the front end into your controllers, and your controllers end up being more API-like. Um, I, I would say in response to that, 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 so the last project I did that had a heavy JavaScript front end was written in Spine, um, which could be the, the least documented, most painful uh, JavaScript framework ever written by anyone. Um, but uh, at the same time, we were serving out to mobile, and we were serving out to other things, and we were serving from the Rails back end. We were just serving JSON. And then everything was consuming the same API. Everything could consume the same API. Any application we put on the front end could consume the same API. And so what I was thinking when I was working with some of the pain of <coughs> the JavaScript was, you know, well, this is easier than it was last week. Um, because I'm better at this now, and uh, and secondly, you know, at least I don't, you know, it, it just felt right, right? You're separating this out. This is an application. It consumes an API. The API, when I was doing the API work, it was so clean, which is the other advantage that splitting it out gave us, was that the Rails work became super, super simple, 
comparatively. And um, so even maybe, you know, the whole thing could have been written faster in Rails, but it would have been less flexible, it would have been less, uh, the app would have looked worse on the front end, it wouldn't have been as responsive, we wouldn't have been able to serve the same stuff to multiple platforms, and the Rails work would have been harder. Um, instead of just being, you know, kind of an afterthought, like, oh yeah, I gotta build this in Rails uh, on the back end and just do that really fast. So, so I found it to be um, ultimately easier when you kind of look at the whole ecosystem of your application and how everything fits together. Yeah, there's no problem with that. Actually, I have a question for the room and that for the Angular developers here. Have any of you tried to internationalize a pure Angular app? And if you have, like, how, how'd you do it? There's no one yet. <laughs> okay. I, I guess my European expansion is thwarted. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, yeah. oh, one more here. So I've only been doing Angular for a few months, and one of the biggest hurdles that I found was just setting up the environment of getting Rails and Angular, uh, just to get like a hello world up, maybe with a couple of different modules that um, that wasn't just from a CDN. Do you have any advice for uh, like Rails developers who are just trying to get into Angular for the environment setup? Um, no, not really, because I can't remember how I did it. But I think he's got. <laughs> I mentioned earlier, you know, and, and it's been echoed that, you know, splitting your front end code apart from your Rails application. I, I've definitely experienced those same pains trying to get Angular set up properly and with the asset pipeline. Um, it, it's not easy, I, I will give you that. Uh, but, you know, cross origin requests are real now. You can use them, I think, even in IE8, which is the, you know, the oldest IE browser that's still around at this point for the most part. So, I mean, barring a technical reason why you have to support IE6 or 7 or, you know, a major business hurdle why building your front end in a, you know, a standalone static web application uh, isn't feasible, you know, I'd say that's the way to go. And it, that way, your experience with Angular is much more, you know, per the documentation. All right. Well, I mean, thanks everyone for coming out. You've been a good audience. Thanks to Patrick for putting this on, Frank for giving me the clicker, everybody for sponsoring. And despite my silence earlier, we are actually looking for some people. So if you're interested in knowing more about us, uh, please come and talk to me. Thanks, everyone. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. Learn more today at rietta.com.